Hi, I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. A pleasure to have you here with us in beautiful Marrakesh. If you could begin with a brief introduction to your amazing film, Marlowe, what can audiences expect when they watch it? Well, it's a, it's a journey back through the Raymond Chandler territory. You know Raymond Chandler, who wrote The Big Sleep and The Long Goodbye, and Foy My Lovely, and these wonderful, wonderful mystery books. You know, it's a territory that people call noir, and uh, which is a term that is kind of not appropriate to this film at all because it's shot in blazing color. You know, Liam Neeson plays the titular character Marlowe, and uh, he, you know, he goes through territory that is both familiar and unfamiliar to people who know those kind of movies, you know. And I guess you could say there's kind of a meta textuality to it in the way it's kind of a homage to Raymond Chandler, you know, based on the Black Eyed Blonde, who yeah. uh, Benjamin Black, who's also actually uh, John Banville. Yes. But also um, in the way that you've kind of played upon the tropes of the genre. Um, yeah. and, and so it's almost about noir as well, much I as it is so. a noir. Well, I hope so. I hope so in a way. I mean, one of the, I mean, one of the reasons I made the movie, the, there were several reasons. One is that John Banville is a friend of mine. So what was that? Bird. <laughs> Bird just luck. shot on me. Okay, <laughs> sorry. But uh, luck for the day. no, it's fine. But uh, is that uh, I read John's book, which I liked. Uh, it was it was they hired. It was it was not bought by me. The producer Alan Maloney um, hired a writer called William Monaghan. You know, who's a great writer to write the script. They sent it to me, and Liam was attached. Liam was interested in playing the main role. So in a way, the kind of the package was irresistible, really. You know, I said, OK, I'll get involved in this. I'd love to if we can uh, sort out the issues of the plot, because there was none, <laughs> you know. But that's often the case in these Chandler things. You know, there, there, there is the appearance of a plot, but there's a lot of kind of kind of up, obfuscation and confusion and stuff like that, you know. So I basically said, look, if we can make this into a story where a woman hires a detective to find her ex-lover only so that she can kill him. Now, maybe I shouldn't say that, but it's fine. <laughs> I, I thought I wouldn't have seen that story before, so, you know, that's what we made in the end, yeah. And in your kind of filmography, you do seem to kind of alternate between sort of really leaning into genre and then doing more kind of realistic um, pieces. Mm. Um, you know, thinking of The Crying Game, thinking mm. of Greta. Um, mm. How for you is genre kind of a tool in your toolbox? Well, it's, 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 it's one of the reasons I make movies in a way, because I mean, I started as a writer and, you know, I started as that serious thing, an Irish fiction writer, you know, we're a very serious breed. And uh, there were no genres in fiction when I started writing, you know, and when I, made my, when I wrote my first movie, Angel, you know, it was a brutal kind of spin on an action movie like Point Blank, you know, it was a revenge story. I thought, this is a different world, you know, there are houses you can visit and each of them has their different themes and their different colours. That's, that's to me what genre is like, you know, so. I mean, I think every, every film I've made has been generic in a way. I mean, the, the next movie I made after Angel was The Company of Wolves, which was uh, a horror fantasy, you know. And then I made Mona Lisa, which is much more similar to this film. Yeah. You know, it's kind of noirish, mm -hmm. it's a mystery, you know. And you, you do seem to have a knack for kind of creating um, these worlds. Um, and it seems like you've had a lot of fun kind of going back to kind of 1930s old Hollywood, mm. the, the sets, the costumes, which I know you, mm. you were actually in Barcelona, mm. really brought to life, but even the pacing mm. um, and the angles and the light. Mm. Um, so, so what was that like for you? Well, it was lovely, but I mean, the basic thing was, you know, the, every, every film presents a problem, you know? And this, present, this movie presented a really specific problem, is that Los Angeles of 1938 no longer exists, you know. I mean, anybody who's been to L.A. knows that they destroy the past the minute it becomes the past, don't they? You know, you walk to Melrose, six months later, the entire city's the entire street has been changed, you know. And it's a refreshing thing I find about L.A. is that actually it's all about the future, but it means that if we were to shoot this movie in L.A., we'd be probably end up shooting it in Hancock Park and nowhere else, you know. So I proposed to them that we, I know Barcelona a bit, and the architecture was, you know, could be what you would call Spanish Mediterranean. And I thought, look, if we look carefully around the city, maybe we'll be able to construct a version of L.A., you know, a, an imaginary version of L.A., but a version that could have existed then, you know. 
There's an area called La Floresta up in the hills that is just like Laurel Canyon, you know, it's like the Los Angeles Canyons. And, you know, so we, we got to work and we managed to create an alternative universe, I think, I mm. hope, yeah. Mm. And you've got such an incredible cast, um, you know, Liam Neeson right yeah. at the centre of it, but also an absolutely luminous Diane Kruger yeah. and Jessica Lange kind of playing, it's like two generations of femme fatale kind of yeah. battling against each other. So how did you assemble these people and work with them? Well, for Liam was first, you know, then we needed to find Claire, or Claire Cavendish, who would be lying to him throughout the movie. And uh, I saw, I saw Diane's work, obviously I'd seen her in, uh, what's it called, in Glorious Bastard. And I saw her, the, the movie she won the prize in Cannes, which was quite luminous. And actually Liam had worked with her before, when I spoke to Liam, he'd worked with her in a movie called Unknown. You know, so I, I met with Diane and we talked through the part, I thought she was perfect for it, you know. Mm -hmm. Jessica, I had been talking to her about another project, you know, which didn't have reach fruition and uh, she had a part that was close to her heart that she wanted to make, but she, she ended up not making and said, look, Jessica, have a look at this script, see if there's a character, see, what, can you find anything in this character? And mm -hmm. she read it and she liked it, mm -hmm. so I was lucky. And I guess on the, on the surface level, it's just like a kind of really entertaining ride going on, mm. being immersed in this world. But you could also say, you know, that period of time, um, sort of in the midst of economic depression, you know, just before yeah. war, there was kind of an anxiety in society at the time. Do you think there's also some of that that chimes with today in some respects? Well, yeah, well, we're sitting in a Europe that's, you know, with a war, not too, well, we're in Morocco actually, aren't we? <laughs> but you know, there are horrible weapons blazing, aren't there, across the Ukraine and stuff like that. It's, I, did, I, I, I wasn't aware of that, but perhaps that is true, you know. I mean, I was very anxious that uh, we portray this version of Los Angeles just on the edge of the Second World War before America had joined, you know. So it's close enough to the, uh, you know, those realities that they can be filming a film that is about the burning of books and with Nazi flags and stuff like that, you know, so there was there was an anxiety to the, uh, yeah, to the story and there was also a recognition in the character that, you know, there are no moral answers really, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, unlike Chandler's Marlowe, Liam Neeson's Marlowe, he recognizes he's lived in a world of compromise, you know, and he mm -hmm. takes the opportunity to use that gun he finds as a you know, a small tool of blackmail himself, really. You know. And you've done such a, a plethora of uh, different films in your career, but I was reading about back when you did um, Interview with a Vampire, and you'd yes. kind of, you know, the doors of Hollywood had been open to you, but you'd somehow cracked the code in the sense that you were able to cast Tom Cruise and, and Brad Pitt, mm. but you were given the freedom to make it like an independent film. Um, yeah. Can you recall much about that? And, and do you think that that's still true today? That's the best way to kind of... Oh, have no, no, of I, I, I can recall exactly that. Yeah, it's... it's David Geffen produced that film, yeah. And um, he sent me a script by Anne Rice. That Anne Rice had written a version of her own novel. And I read the script and I thought... I said to him, David, you know, she's cut out whole sections of her novel, you know, here. And uh, I said, let me just you know, go back to the script, go back to the novel and the script. So I rewrote the script and I introduced whole swathes of a book, you know. And then he asked me to make, the Warner Brothers asked me to make the movie. I think it had been hanging around for about 20 years. And I said, look, I'll make it if you can give me the freedom to make it as an independent movie. And he said, okay, I will give you that, I'll do that. I'll ensure that that's the way you make this movie. It was a unique circumstances, you know, it will never happen to me again. You know, it never did. And I think it would, it, it rarely happens to other directors, really, you know, that you'd be given this huge canvas and these huge stars and actually be allowed to make it the way you would make an art movie, you know, but mm. that's what they did. Mm. Yeah. So I was very happy to do that. And I'd also um, seen that you'd spoken in the past about um, the transition that was made, you know, from people filming on film to digital mm. and that perhaps as a filmmaker, um, you know, maybe something is lost in that transition. Well, everything is lost. <laughs> I'll tell you, no, everything is lost. For, for one thing, uh, <coughs> yeah, the way light kind of bounces off the, the little chemical constructs that construct negative film, it's, it's totally different to what happens with a digital camera, you know. 
I mean, that camera you see there, it's photographing me, it's reconstituting the, the image, kind of in loaded numbers, and it's, it's giving something back, you know, that is not what, it's not photography as you'd know it, you know. I mean, a 35 mil, you know, a, a piece of negative film actually exposed itself to the light, you know what I mean? So it's a record of, it's a genuine record of what was there before the, before the lens, you know. Mm. Also, it, it means, I, I think, and I don't want to be pejorative about this, but it's too easy to use a digital camera, you mm. know? It's both easy and hard. Do you understand what I mean? Mm. You don't need to know anything about how to construct an image, you know? With a digital camera, the focus is, always drifts. We've become used to handheld cameras, which are beautiful, which is great, but I miss the kind of eroticism of a real, you know, cinema image, you know, in a lot of what I see these days, you know. Yeah. And it's, so it's also too easy and too hard because when you shoot with digital, you have all these bloody screens around you, yeah. you know, and you're looking through the camera and you're saying to the cameraman, you know, it doesn't look this, re really doesn't look that way. And he says, oh yeah, but it won't. And they begin to, they begin to like changing your television and they begin to change the color balance and all that sort of yeah. stuff. You go, okay, well, why are we, photographing it like this that it's it's kind of complicated you know mm. and um, anyway you've also said in the past that um even when you're making a film that is kind of maybe more based in the real world let's say it's still kind of infused with a sense of kind of magic and kind mm. of part of your past growing up in ireland and mm. sort of the folk tales that kind of you know mm. the superstitions mm. kind of have like fed into that so, mm. so maybe we can talk a little bit about that how that's fed into your filmmaking the superstitions. Yeah. Sort of oh, that's why that's him. why I like making horror movies and ghost movies and vampire movies and werewolf movies because you know I grew up in a country that believed this crap existed. You know, it's I don't I don't know. I'm like I was born in 1950. You know, I kind of believed the dead walked when I was a kid. I don't know why I did. Maybe my father told me these ghost stories that he probably shouldn't have told me, but. You know, I, I, I suppose I grew up in a con context that was not too far from medi medievalism in a way, in every which way, you know, the, it was an entire country that was entirely run by the Catholic Church, which, as you believe, that everything you see doesn't exist, basically, or shouldn't exist, you know, so it's a, it's a strange, it was a, you know, I, I, I don't know, I... When I moved to London the first time and began to make movies in England, I found it so refreshing that this was a rational world, you know. But maybe I brought my own irrationality into it, you know. And in terms of your future projects, have you already got something in the pipeline? Do you know what you're going to tackle next? Yeah, no, I've written a novel. It's, it's actually about the things you're just talking about. It's about superstitions and about irrationality and about how kind of irrational fantasies kind of change people's lives, yeah. It's called The Well of St. Nobody. It will be released in, uh, the novel will be published in next year. And I'm, of several movies I'm thinking of making here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I might make another movie with Liam, I'm not sure as yet. And in terms of, I don't know, your bucket list, in, do you have any kind of itches you really want to scratch? Is there another actor you'd love to work with, a writer, a genre that you haven't tried yet? Do you have any? No, I would just like to, to make all the unwritten scripts, all, all the scripts I've written that haven't been made, you know? And there are a lot of them. I've written, I've written a lot of scripts that haven't been made. I'd love to make them all and then collapse, yeah. <laughs> and looking at the, the other filmmakers out there, who, whose other work right now do you really admire? Whose other work do I really admire? That's a very interesting question. <laughs> Not to be um, Let me think. I like Jordan Peele's work, you know. I like a lot of the contemporary horror directors, you know. Um, there was a movie made in Ireland called The Quiet Girl, which is in the Irish language. I thought that was a terribly beautiful thing, you know. I like... Uh, you're talking of the younger directors, okay. Beyond that, I can't say. Okay, <laughs> thank you. And and how do you see also the way the cinema industry has changed in terms of the fact that we are seeing this kind of explosion of platforms? So it's kind of maybe moved us slightly away from cinema, the big screen, but then there's also a lot more opportunities for. I know it's a, it's, a, it's a strange time, isn't it? Yeah, there's huge opportunities for new directors and for alternative voices and for you know, alternative cultures and all that sort of stuff. But as these opportunities expand, 
it seems the cinemas shrink, you know. So there are an enormous amount of movies that are being made, you know. And the, o uh, the only outlet, or the main outlet for them, seems to be the festival circuit, you know. So, so it's kind of triumphant and tragic at the same time, you know. And just finally, how does it feel to be here in Marrakesh and have your film showing on the, the screen in, in, in the gala well, last it's, night? I, 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 was, I lived here actually in 1972 when I was very young, in, in the Medina in there. Conditions of dire poverty, I never thought I would be bringing a movie here. It's beautiful, yeah. I, I've always loved Morocco, yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing Thank you very much.